everyone and welcome to today's show. Today we are going to discuss preparation for home birth, the first steps, so to speak. And of course, I am joined by the very special Dr. Robin Thompson, who is not only an expert in this area, but has a unique perspective in both birthing with and beside women at home and in the hospital system. So we know that you'll find this very helpful today. So thank you again for your precious time today, Dr. Robin. Pleasure. As always. Okay, so we we were speaking a little bit before and you felt it was important to say a little disclaimer, I suppose, on every woman being unique. Would you like to touch upon that before we get started? Sure. Yeah, sure. Look, in my practice, I like to consider every woman as her unique self, her unique baby, her unique family, genetically unique, physiologically unique, anatomically unique, psychologically unique, neurologically unique. We are all unique on the planet. So one rule does not fit all. And hopefully in my practice, I don't have rules because that puts women under pressure. I have understanding, sharing knowledge and, and listening to the woman and her instincts all the time. Because if I listen to her and observe her, then I can be guided by her because she knows herself better than anybody else does. So that's the way I tend to work. And uh, yes, things do, do happen sometimes where we need to seek uh, colleague support. And I talk about complementary services. Each colleague is complementary to the other, but most of all, we are together with the woman. There's no doubt that we should not be together with the woman. No one is left out of it. No one is on top of the pedestal. It's all about how this woman and her needs are met and also the access to the system without any obstacles at all yeah. if you need it and you think you need to transfer then that's the way to go and in my 25 years of birthing at home with women i never once transferred by ambulance because we talk about it together if we think it's an appropriate move then we take that move yeah. and that's all part of the prenatal preparation as well Yes, that's very beautifully said. And it does slide quite nicely into what we decided would be our first main topic on preparation and the first steps for preparation for home birth. And that is education. And you just spoke about the prenatal care and, and how you would be able to discuss this, not only with your with your care provider, but I think also with your advocate as well and whoever you choose to be there with you. Um, but education, having been able to have that knowledge to make mm -hmm. informed decisions, why is that so important? Especially because in when we share information, that that the woman understands more, her partner or her advocate or those that are with her understand more, so then they can support her in in the journey that she's taking. But if they're not understanding, then they might be fearful too, and that transfers to her. So. I think sharing knowledge is one of the major factors that we have to, as professionals, learn to do and not share by coercion, not share by fear. Because when we do that, we create a merry-go-round in that woman's brain, in her partner's brain, whoever's around her, but particularly hers. And it goes around and round and up and down and she's all the time trying to rationalise what they said and why they said it. So if we go the other way, and we turn the merry-go-around and we slow it down, mm -hmm. then her instincts can work. Her, her desire for knowledge, what she needs to know will help. And then what we think may help her even more can be shared. So I do believe that it's so, so, so important for midwives, for anybody else that's uh, obstetricians, anybody else that's working with a woman is not to frighten her, to work through the education with her and not thrust upon her, you know, you have to be induced at 39 weeks. That's just not the way we go. We look at her as a unique mother, her progress through labour, her progress through her birth, her pro uh, pro before that, her progress through her pregnancy, and then after the baby's born, her transition to breastfeeding. Yes. So, and that's, that's that that's transition we do talk about, and recently yeah. um, we, we you wrote a blog, a blog about that, the beautiful transition throughout, and how it is all connected, and it's not yeah. segmented. You said to me, and that really, that really stayed with me because it is sort of segmented for everyone else, and it, it has seemed to have become 
separate yeah. parts, which it shouldn't be. And we say here, like, you have to see the obstetrician at so many weeks. Well, why? You don't need to see the obstetrician. Obstetrician skilled, ab absolutely skilled. And if that's a woman's choice, of course, that's the way to go. But you don't have to see it set regular times because that's just a mathematical approach to it and not a biophysiological approach to it. And so it's all about choice and it's all about recognising the woman's choice. And if there are circumstances where you need to talk about possible benefits, possible risks, mm -hmm. possible alternatives, the right for another opinion, then it's very appropriate that you do that. And you should do that any time you are looking for consent to do something. And you cannot do anything to a woman uh, unless you do have consent. And also that means that only in urgent situations, emergency situations, does the senior obstetrician make decisions. And that's so, a very good point because we don't often yeah. talk about enough the alternatives, the benefits, mm. the pros yeah. and cons of any decision that you have to make. And I think that having that education, that knowledge behind you, allows mm. you to feel confident in making mm. a decision rather than feeling a sense of vulnerability and then handing over that decision yeah. making, which is so common. Yeah. I did the same and I was very fortunate that I didn't need interventions, but I was close. It could have happened. Mm. And I, I feel like uh, women are being put in a position, you said earlier, mm. about that fear, making decisions based on fear because they aren't being given alternatives, they aren't mm. being offered second opinions. So I'm glad we mentioned that because I think it will definitely open a light bulb think, moment for many. Yeah, I'm not sure whether I'm right or wrong and I'm sure people would agree and disagree and that's fine, that's what we do. But I do think that we don't have time to listen. We don't sit and talk with, we talk to. Yeah. And talking to is a dominant thing. It's talking with and listening and exchanging information and it's information that's relative to that mother and her her background and her genetics. Mm -hmm. And having a family history is so, so, so important. Understanding her family history, understanding and listening to what her needs are, what her plan might be, and then aiming to achieve what we can within the framework of her feeling confident, within the framework of her feeling respected, and within the framework of us knowing that we are being responsible and we are being accountable and that our duty of care is being met oh, by the way absolutely. we're working with women. And you mentioned the woman's plan because it is yeah. about the woman, the unique woman, the person that is going through this beautiful journey. And, and hopefully alongside researching and education and gaining all that lovely knowledge, this, this woman, the birther, would have, would have gained... I suppose, her own birth preferences and wishes mm. through her own research as well. And that's why a birth plan is so important. Um, and including breastfeeding in the birth plan, as you do mm -hmm. teach in the online education. And you mm -hmm. do also provide a birth plan template yeah. for those to adapt to their own unique situation. So I'm happy to um, to share any, any information with that later on as well, if anyone. Uh, it's, going, it's, it's, it's increasing the woman's confidence in self. It's, and that, that then gives us a more respectful approach to what we're doing then too. We're not dominating, we're not standing over, we're not uh, frightening her. We're talking about the reality of the moment if, it ne if it's necessary. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we don't do that weeks in advance, frightening her along the way. Yeah, there to... doesn't seem to be a lot of respect around women no. making those own decisions. No. I read a story recently where a mother de de denied taking a gestational diabetes examination or doing the test, sorry, um, because of the, the reason that was given was because of her B, BMI, um, which mm -hmm. she didn't agree with. After doing her own research, she decided not to. And and she felt as though they were very judgmental in her decision making. And mm -hmm. and you could read the way that that was being explained, the story, you could really see how, yeah. how actually she'd done nothing wrong. Obviously, they no. don't need to agree with her, but they should have supported her and there was no support whatsoever. And it's no. a shame. It really is. Um, years ago, I had a, a, a woman and her partner come to me because they'd been um, told all of these things they had to do. She was a big woman and, you know, her blood sugars will be high and she has to do this. And anyway, she made an appointment to come and see me. And she said she wanted to have her baby at home. And I said, well, let's let's sit down and talk about you know, the things that are important, your family history, your previous birth, and all of those things. Anyway, she came to the point, 
that they got cross with her because she was wearing overalls with buckles on because it was she was a big girl, you know, and they just said she was too just too far overweight to have her baby at home. So I thought, well, that's unreasonable because she's had a baby before and we don't know whether she can do this or not. So I had a colleague with me, a beautiful colleague, Annie Sprague, and we, we worked with her and she did a beautiful birth at home, a beautiful birth, what she needed to do, her partner there, her toddler there. And then while they were coming together afterwards and she was feeding her baby, um, we went and did cleaned up the kitchen and did the washing, put the washing through the machine and put it on the line. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> we'd given them time together and, and we were checking, like one of us were checking her to make sure she wasn't bleeding, that she was okay. She was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. So I, I think we make judgments that we really shouldn't do. We need to work within the moment. Now, we had set up the transfer system for her to... Um, complementary services, of, a complementary obstetric services, the hospital that was, you Is know. Is that in uh, the case of an emergency, which you were? Yeah, we set all that up during, during the rest of her pregnancy, so she felt very confident that she... So I'm not saying this is for everybody, but we need to listen and we need to... to we, we need not to make decisions for people that are used to create fear for them. You know, and if they really want to do something, then we follow what they want to do to the level where we think that they are safe. Mm -hmm. And then if we think that things, the benefits and the risks and the alternatives should be discussed, then we do it again. Mm -hmm. And we do it that right through the pregnancy if necessary. What but I am getting numerous, numerous stories from women at the moment that is actually scaring me with what's happening with the intervention rate to them psychologically emotionally physically it's just phenomenal what's happening it's, and I'm not it's, it's the highest on record is, um from it's my own just so scary so what i'm asking is what has happened apart from the the virus what has happened to our practitioners what has happened to the system why why are women feeling like this mm -hmm. why are we doing what we're doing and we i feel like the um the level of inter intervention uh, the increase of interventions, unnecessary interventions, we should say, and coercion. I feel like they go hand in hand. But I, yes. I think that um, I think that based on the topic today with home birth, a lot of women are choosing to home birth or wanting to choose to mm. home birth, and they're then they're, they're not eventually doing it because of the fear or the rules or the policies mm. that are mm. put on them. So I guess we could take the opportunity today to say, do your own research and look at those figures. I know here in the UK, there was um, new research that came out in 2020 that showed the, the statistics of how much less at risk you are of unnecessary interventions, of tearing and other, and other serious conditions as well by birthing at home. And I'm sure that research is available in every country. So we do encourage that and I know yes. that you you do your own research with that as well Robin and you do yes. talk openly and, and you know we, we provide yeah. links for women and and Rachel yeah. who's head yeah. of head of education hi Rachel shout out to the yeah. Amazing, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah Rachel provides a whole lot of information my um Ashley my student midwife consultant she she's really good at finding the research and she helps with that too so I think I think, yes, the latest research, but I think back five years is what I was always taught. Go back five years and see. And, and if people find the research really hard to read, read the abstract and then go through and read the introduction and the conclusion because a lot of people have struggling through reading all the data and that. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of jargon, isn't yeah, there? That's a bit of overwhelming. Yeah. That's a bit overwhelming for some. So another way around it is to do that if you're studying research and that of course you read the the detail mm. and and very yeah. good tip actually because it is it's, it's hard it's like learning another language isn't it yeah now look there's two amazing connections that i'm seeing with uh, sarah wickham professor sarah wickham yes. dr sarah wickham in the uk i have all her books so i have them for rachel i i want them for all of my um uh ed academy to be able to use as references yeah, the information wonderful. and the way she goes about research is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I also have um, re uh, have been reading some of, is it Deborah Niger's work? 
I haven't she's heard of her, but I'm sure you're correct. Okay. She seems to be amazing and along the same, uh, like I'm certainly agreeing with most of what she's, or probably almost all of everything she's saying. I think that the wonderful thing about, well, Sarah at least, um, equally as yourself, is they provide all the details rather than mm. a bias. So yeah. that women can make their own decision based on the information. And and they collate that evidence in an understanding mm in a way to understand easier as well. And look, well. there's some amazing researchers here. There's Sue Kilday, they're mm -hmm. all, always putting something out. There's um, there's Hannah Darlin, there's uh, um, Jenny Gamble, who's now in the UK. She's She's gone from here back to the UK oh, and she's sending us so information all the time. <laughs> and I'm loving what she's sending. I'm enjoying that. Uh, we That's have, amazing. yeah, we have um, Jai Allen, who's really good at, the research and, and, you know, the writing. So there's some very, very, um, uh, what do you say, extensively, uh, I don't know what the word is, but really very good researchers. And there's some very good research. However, the individual woman has to fit within that too. So it's again, opening up our minds and listening and observing and if a woman does want to have a home birth, let's listen to her. Yeah. And, yeah. and the other thing I'm seeing quite a lot now is there's more and more women having breech births. Now, it's a long time since I've seen that, but there's more and more women. And I'm, I'm following that as well with great interest to say, well, you know, there must be women who are very fed up with what's happening. Mm. Uh, and, you know, and if they're having breech births and they're teaching other women and they're involved yeah. in education in their own way woman to woman mm. so again you i'm not saying that weren't you dr robin i was a great chair yeah. i had my feet up feet first <laughs> up here. is it called is it called sunny side up <laughs> no it's called oh do you want me to say what my mother said oh i don't know will we get in trouble i don't think so my <laughs> mum I was, a, I was a frank breach, which means my legs were straight, right? So my hamstrings were fully extended. <laughs> and they still are, they're still pretty good when I'm, I'm at 78. And not as good as they used to be, but they're still pretty good. But my mum used to say to me all the time, and I say this with, with the best grace that I can, ask about face. <laughs> I love it. And and you're talking about your, your hamstrings being pretty decent now. I saw yeah. a video recently of you dancing away, and I must say I can uh, definitely agree yeah. that you, your legs still do a good job. And she said to me all through my younger years that I do everything about fate. <laughs> and you know what? I do too. I actually do because I like to look at the bottom before I go to the top, you know, and so... It's really interesting how we are all so unique, mm -hmm. very, very unique. So when we were playing charades once with my two beautiful grandsons, they're now 29 and 28 and I was their midwife, right, coming up 28, and they were born at home, one in Japan and one in Melbourne. I flew to Japan. Um, we used to play charades and so I bent over one one, one <laughs> with my head, with my legs straight and my head looking at them through that way. And none of them could none of them could get the answer. <laughs> well, I'm sure they would now after watching this one. Oh, that's brilliant. Yes, so, no, no, it's it is it's very interesting to always hear mm. the and personal sure experiences that, as well. And I'm yeah, and I'm sure that and I know there can be difficult times with breech births too. It's mm -hmm. not always that easy, but it's certainly happening uh, when you're following the women and their stories. It's certainly happening more and more. Yeah, there's definitely some questions needing to be asked there, isn't there? Yeah. Sure. So the you next point I wanted to... You need a team. Sorry, you, need a beautiful, you do need a team. You need a lovely team where they are complementary with each other and they're looking after you uniquely. Oh, gosh, that's so true. This, that's yeah. what I just popped up on the screen, care provider. So choosing your midwife, your supportive network around you is, yeah. is very true. Why is it important to consider a midwife or a birth? person or a doula or someone that is supportive of your decision? Well, in this country, um, a, a midwife is a registered, registered, so she's registered with an, uh, an authority. Yeah, it's the same thing in the UK, yeah, although many doula. midwives are no longer registered <coughs> and have become me. doulas. They do yes, this to escape the policies, I yes, think. Yes, and that's what they're doing, I think, here, mm. a lot, a lots too, doing that too. 
but within within the complementary system and within the system they don't have the same uh, um, ability to to they can talk with the woman but they can't talk with anybody else in a way that's going to be effective mm -hmm. and so um whereas someone like me would you know become straight to the point if I felt yeah. some I felt a woman was being not treated properly or yeah. something was not right I would and I won't give you examples now because it can be <laughs> <what. laughs> but I feel there so needs to be more up. strength beside women um, yeah to stand and up I have that. some beautiful friends who are doulas that's and and doulas you know they they they, they play a specific role but again, that's a complementary service if a woman chooses a midwife too, because if you don't connect with the midwife, things can go wrong because that has happened. And I'm fully aware of that recently. Uh, so, and I, I don't go into personal details about people, but I'm fully aware of that recently where the doula was with the woman for, you know, something like eight hours and didn't contact the midwife. Yeah, so, I think there's, there's a lot of... Um risk around how many limitations there are on home births at yeah. the moment and they're mm. not ready the midwife services aren't being readily available so that's really not helping the transition yeah. if there are emergencies yeah. into the hospital system as you yeah mentioned. and the midwives are being pushed to limits where they're providing their care but it's not the duty of care that's expected of the reasonable midwife reasonable midwife because of what's being pushed yeah. onto them the number of women they're seeing, the number of babies, that's duplicating every mm. time they see and then they cannot provide the duty of care that's required for each unique woman. So this is where we need to stand strong and say, no, if you have a problem, I understand it's difficult, but please go to management about that because I cannot leave here now. I have a duty of care yeah, and I'm going to stay here till I'm finished. Yeah. So, you know, and unless we start to to take that responsibility back and and put it back, then we're going to be forever pushed to our limits and then yes. you become exhausted. Yeah, that's definitely you know? the case for many, I know, many UK midwives. I have a few friends mm. studying in the field and, and many are leaving. Same as teaching, there, there's a field that's desperate for more and for a job mm. that is done out of love, um, mm. it shows you there's something wrong if there is less than the usual yeah. numbers. So that's a very yeah. good point. So, so, so let's we have move out of the, the heavy stuff and go more into the, I wouldn't say exciting stuff, but the, the lighter stuff. So the birth space. So considering your environment, if you do choose to birth at home, the light, the comfort, give us some some suggestions here. Dr. Okay, so I, I, I don't get too heavily involved in what women do at home because they know their home better than me. I'm actually a guest when I go into their home. So when I go into their home, um, if they ask me a question, I might provide a suggestion. I do not tell them what to do, but they set things up the way it feels comfortable for them in their home. I've had women set up their birth pills on the veranda out in the back of the house. I've had them on the back lawn. I've had them in front of the fireplace in the winter. Uh, you know, it's, it's different for everybody how they go about what they're doing. But the most important thing is that it's the way that they feel comfortable with their unique knowledge of self when they know that instinctive knowledge they'll know it and they can change it around anytime they like it's not doesn't have to be there and we don't say no you can't have a water birth or you can't get in the water a lot of women will hop in the water and then they'll hop out when they're ready yeah mm. you know or vice versa they'll work, work, be working around with their body out and then they'll hop in so again it's it's being clearly observant it's been listening to and and uh you know, documenting as you go along when you're talking with them and also when you're doing their observations. But, you know, I don't do vaginal examinations unless they're absolutely necessary and, and the mother and I agree. So they're, they're routine things that don't need to be done unless it's absolutely necessary. From my and practice... And that's the beautiful freedom of a home birth and yeah. uh, a low intervention birth is yes. that you have the freedom to move around and dance and mm. get in and out of the pool and switch mm. positions if you if you feel that's necessary rather than yeah. being tied to a bed or to sure. monitors with straps and wires and yeah and i have a beautiful video on um the the um what's it called the uh, I, I actually produced i went flew to huddersfield to present it 
to the university some many years ago now and it's um it's just there and i can't see but it's all about <laughs> water births, right it's all about the beautiful water births that yeah. i have been involved in not all of them some of them and and consent to do that mm -hmm. and and the women and the babies are amazing you know they can have cords around them and we just help unravel them there's there's a whole lot of things there in that beautiful video that shows that um, we should not say no to water birth just because it's an institution. We need the midwife who's confident, who's experienced, and who will, um, you know, use the complementary services if necessary. Mm -hmm. I don't talk about, what's the word they use now? Um, anyway, it's like collusion, you know, I don't do that. Mm -hmm. I just talk about having relationships with your colleagues that, you're able to talk with each other. And that's all I've ever been used to in my yeah, practice. Anyway. Having a multi-agency connection is important rather than segmenting, again, segmenting yeah. everything. And, and I can it, here in the UK, I'm not sure if it's the same in, in Australia, but um, I know it certainly certainly is in, in the USA for those paying privately, which is a shame. In, in the UK, there are several birth centres, less now than there was, but there are several birth centres which allow the freedom of movement, the birth pool, a, a much quieter, calmer, darker space than the hospital system with very good connections to the hospital system in the case of emergency. And a lot of women are choosing that rather than a home birth. Um, but there are there is an increase in numbers of home births as well. So it's good to explore it all, I think. Yeah, we used to have lots of birth centres and then they were all closed down. Mm -hmm. And, so you know, nice. I've been to a conference where I've heard a doctor say home birth is not safe. So I've asked him some very mighty questions about his knowledge of home birth. And he didn't have any knowledge about home birth. He'd never been to one, never seen, a, you know, never been beside a midwife who's working with a woman at home. It's, so, it's really scary because they should be held accountable for things that are said because someone will see that and, and that's it. They will take that point yeah. blank and that will be with them forever, you know. <laughs> so well, I had a couple scary. of wonderful midwives with me. The three of us were at this conference um, and Terry G is really well known in, in Australia for her expertise in home birth. And um, yeah, so we 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 uh, we listened carefully, but we also spoke out prominently. <laughs> I bet you did. I'm glad yeah. you did. Thank you for always speaking out. You always yeah. do. That that does fit quite nicely in with having an advocate. So being an advocate, so having that knowledge to advocate for yourself and having a, a strong advocate in your birth partner, your midwife, your team. Let's talk about how important it is for them to be well-educated and be able to make informed decisions also. Yeah, together with the woman as much as possible through the, through the pregnancy, through the transition of pregnancy, through labour and through birth and, and into breastfeeding because then they're learning together at, the, at what knowledge they need. They might be different, but they're learning together. They might be that one has more knowledge than the other. Who knows? I don't know the detail of everybody, but that helps too by learning in a togetherness um, but also you know a lot of them know know a whole lot of things too so you just revise that you cover it again if necessary they'll ask you questions and you include them all the time they are inclusive now also that they the the woman can can have an understanding that if she can't make a decision and it's not an emergency decision that her advocate will help her do that and you know that's frowned upon but she can do that that's why her advocate is with her beside her and and the same as the midwife is with and beside her and the beautiful caroline flint from the uk talked about being with woman and many years ago that clicked with me and especially when she came to australia and i met her it clicked with me you know it was just the right we are with woman we're not actually overriding her and telling her what to do where if she wants guidance we can do that but, you know, just for example, if she's got a little breech baby on board, her in her uterus, I should say. <laughs> oh, she's got, well, I think about every now and then to, to suggest to her that she tilts head down, bottom up to give the baby a drink. Because when the baby's at term and, you know, the, the volume's not as high, the uh, amniotic fluid's not as high, then... You know a little tilt every now and then gives the baby an opportunity to have a drink and if you feel the baby hiccuping then you know the baby's drinking and wow. you know they're simple little, they're simple little things honestly and then we talk about obstructed labor but if i if i was concerned about a baby progressing 
then I would ask my advocate to have helped me feel over my pubic bone to see if I thought the shoulder might be sitting on top of the pubic mm. bone because once the shoulder's over there and especially on women that have had more than one baby because mm -hmm. their uterus opens at that abdominus rectus muscle opens wider and 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 again if they're shorter between hip and shoulder the baby grows forward so it's not unusual for the shoulder to be sitting on or over the pubic bone and and again Annie and my other colleagues we've done this many times is with with consent we one comes behind and the other one comes forward and we little belly to belly and we just lift and gently over oh, wow and to spend a day a in your brains there's a baby oh, there you know and, and and one woman having her sixth baby boy she was just having that love, love just couldn't get it so Annie yeah. said and so we did that with her consent and her baby came down like you would not believe. <laughs> so I think we've just got to think about a few more things before we rush off to do the emergency mm -hmm cesarean section and then we're doing major abdominal surgery mm -hmm. on me and i think knowing like you said earlier knowing the the, the person who's birthing the lady's wishes her birth preferences yes. and doing your best to support that is mm. is what the environment is about as well yeah. i think and you know it, and it depends on it depends on the unique situations in the moment always it's mm -hmm. not something that you can always preempt and you know you might preempt by an ultrasound which i don't believe are always accurate that you know this this and this but however the baby turns out fine or the weight's all yeah. right or or just recently the baby was going to have a major cardiac problem didn't have a cardiac problem yeah at all. that's very common actually i have yeah. saw something on the uk news this morning ultrasound throughout pregnancy showed singleton baby gave birth to twins yes yeah that's that seems to be quite common yeah, so too imagine that eh? <laughs> we're very reliant on technology when also if we listen to the woman and we use our skills and we use a very tender touch we're not hard and rough mm. with women then you have much much more information and i'm talking about palpating the baby fingertips soft and then asking her to palpate her baby because she can feel it inside yeah it's so a shame it's not taught knowledge. isn't it because it would yeah. be a lovely experience to be able to know or to be taught yeah that and then well. you know when you're on the shoulder that you can pick up the baby's heart rate so partner can listen with just an ear or um, you can listen with a, the old-fashioned pinards like i've got four here yes. uh, that i yeah. that i use yeah. all the time you can use with a little electronic doppler but once you tie a, a woman to a machine and she's locked in and strapped to a machine then we change the progress of her labor mm -hmm. and sometimes we interpret the readouts wrongly and we don't allow for what would take place normally as the baby negotiates the brim mm -hmm. the center of the pelvis and the outlet which changes shape and changes angles so there's a lot 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 of information about progress of labor that could be you know part a, a really good part of the um and listening to the mother and sure she gets to the stage where she can't do this anymore <laughs> what's that called that's called the transition isn't it the yeah, last the final we, transition yeah then we help her through that time which is generally fairly short she's yeah. almost there and uh you know stamp the, i can't do this anymore i remember shouting that i do remember shouting yeah. that and they and then, 20 minutes later then, so, yeah, yeah they're in transition and before you know that little head or that little bottom is there and, oh beautiful yeah. Yeah. Well, you can and do you, it look, with can. the deepest, yeah with the deepest respect there are things that go beyond what we can do and that's where we work we don't go away we stay and work complementary with the medical team yeah. yes that's very important yeah. ad i think and that's where we need to reconnect again so we yes. don't have politicians and organizations and everybody else Policies. telling us how to practice yeah there's a lot holding holding midwives yeah. back so the yeah. last thing we want to cover which i do think is fun but i am strange like that is we spoke about it before <laughs> in one of our shows and i said we will be discussing this further and that is the birth kit so of course depending on the country and the midwife the expertise we can't tell if we can't really share what everyone else in their professional skill will be sharing as their birth kit but what did you carry for your home birth kit? well way back then i had a mini labor ward and I in your have, bag yeah well i had a, i had more than one bag okay i had my resuscitation gear i had my oxygen and suction i had and that was all encased in safe casing 
Mm -hmm. because uh, one midwife here uh, had a car accident and her oxygen blew up and she actually passed away because wow. it was floating around in the back so we had we have safely oxygen cylinders and and and, and they're modified now complete compared to what i had mm. i used to have the small size c oxygen cylinder um and uh i had my uh i could put a drip up so i would have intravenous in my kit all that ready to go i would have solution hartman solution is what we carried in those days which is a glucose saline solution and we could um, volume expand if someone had a bleed and uh, while well, help was coming so that we, she's not depleted of you know fluid moving through her body um, we could put a cannula in we could do uh, per, i could do perineal repair um, but i wouldn't do a third or a fourth degree per perineal repair without going to hospital and never did I have to do that but I can do you know a, a, a perineal repair so um, and and we did that we learned that with the beautiful obstetricians that I worked with we, oh gosh they were just gorgeous in those days honest and the GPs that we worked with were phenomenal and um and yes i think so, yeah, a lot of the midwife power is under underestimated yeah. midwives um, truly are magicians in their yeah. field and we carried certain drugs and uh you know prescribed drugs we didn't prescribe then nor do i really want to prescribe now because i believe that's my medical colleague's role but again we carry things we carry oxytocin syntocin and whatever it was in those days we could put it in a drip or we could inject it and and we could inject it intramuscularly or intravenously whatever we was appropriate for that for that moment uh, and again we didn't go go doing you know we we learnt how to not use cord traction we didn't pull on the cord because often you're pulling on the cord and it hasn't separated so you create bleeding we're waiting for the signs of separation. We're waiting. This is for in the reference cord. to the placental birth, is that right? Yes. Yeah, so so we're not doing all that. So in our birth kit, if we had a bleed, if or if the woman had a bleed, then we could deal with that in the way that was appropriate in the moment till till help arrived. Yeah. So, you know, so our birth kit was a mini labour ward. I had scales. You know, I hate scales, but you know, <laughs> because they they they're not all calibrated the same. Mm. But anyway, some women would like to know their baby's birth weight. Others didn't care, so we didn't weigh. I watched carefully each day I saw them, and I didn't weigh. I didn't weigh till day ten. Yeah, and, you know, and by then they're well on the way because all babies lose weight. So I had scales. What else did I have? Um, what about a Doppler? Did you have? Uh, I had a little Doppler that, yeah, a, a small electronic Doppler, but it had a readout on it so that I could turn it right down and, and it couldn't be heard, but we could still see the readout because sometimes the feedback is distracting. Mm. And especially if the woman's in the innate period, inert period, where she, you know, inert period, where she goes into a quiet time and sleeps for a while, you can continue to listen to the baby's heart rate and you can hear her when she's having a contraction, but the intensity of it during the rest period reduces. And, and so you're still observing her very carefully. And so many times when they're ready to wake up, they wake up and they are ready to give birth. So you've got to be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh yes, well, I think uh, that was quite relatable to my birth So with well. the kit, with the kit, it's, so if, if, if any midwives are watching, they'll know what I'm talking about. But for the women, it is a it's a small content of what you would have in a labor ward situation but equally as safe and and that's one question that i know yeah. women will ask when they watch this is home birth safe we have covered that before but overall if your pregnancy is straightforward you've said in the past and if you trust your paternal instincts and you have a team you trust then it is just as safe if not safer nowadays yes it is birth. and and women give birth and i've only ever had two women who've given birth before i arrived i've even flown and they have waited for me oh yes i well, love my sarah and and free birth didn't she before her midwife got there oh, that's, the true, but I, yeah, that's recent yes that's recent yeah. with sarah she got on with it <laughs> did it beautifully and is much more feeling stronger because of her ability to do that there wasn't yeah, enough sure. so twice i've been in a situation where i've come to the front door and i can hear the baby ah. <laughs> oh, another one i'm in the car driving 
and I get a call and I can hear the, her partner Babies and her work together. No, baby hadn't arrived. They were still working together, but I was in the traffic. They did, there was not enough time from asking me to come to, to get there. So I just gently talked with them during the drive and uh, they gave birth before I got there, but everything was fine. We, yeah. That's so I, and that's only twice. And it's not very often you, when you, especially if you've got a buddy system like I have, I always have a buddy and we buddy each other. We look after each other. So I don't go in and take over if I'm a buddy. I go in to help my colleague when it's necessary. And then if she needs a rest, then I take a little time with the woman, you know, so she can have a rest, depending on the time and what it all what it's yeah. all about. Or one of us write the notes. Uh, we, we document differently to what they do, ticking boxes. We don't tick boxes as such. We're not we're not there to take statistics for the organisation. Yeah. We are there for our duty of care to write the story in detail about what's happening. And we've done that forever. And the women get a copy of that back. They know that they have a copy of the story of their birth and they can add to it anywhere they like in pregnancy. They might write in their notes. In, you know, Lots of women that. carry journals and keep journals for yep. that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, so, I think that those watching, considering or even planning or preparing for home birth would have found today's session incredibly helpful. Um, I do wish that we could spend a lot longer talking about this because there is just so much. Your experience is just, you have a wealth of knowledge and expertise in this area, don't you? So uh, thank you to all the beautiful them. women who, who chose me to be their midwife at the time. And I have many, many beautiful colleagues who are just amazing midwives who are still home birthing and Mari Heath. Um, and, and so, you know, it goes on and on through the generations. But what I think we need to function, function really well on now is mentoring the young side by side, not leaving them on their own, not letting them, you know, walking in and out and telling them what to do, you're in charge now or whatever. I don't know that's the exact words. but you There know, is, I, seems to be a lot of pressure. Um, yeah, I think someone really qualified to just pick up from from someone yeah. else. I suppose it's the pressure that everyone is under. But yeah, and I, even I, when the team are mentoring with me, they're side by side with me. They're they're learning and mentoring, and and I'm not saying I'm right all the time. I'm not. Nobody's perfect. No one. <laughs> but the bottom line is, we do not go out with the intent to harm. We do not do that. And I don't believe there's any medical practitioner that does that. Mm. Or if they have, it hasn't been in my experience. So yeah, I don't think we go out with intent to harm. Things happen. It's how we deal with it at the time and what our support systems are for us and what our support systems are with the woman. Mm -hmm. Very true. So true. Mm -hmm. Well, I do wish I had just a percentage of your knowledge. I see some people are popping in to say hello. We've got Teresa. Hi, Teresa. She says she's from Brussels. Good vibes from Brussels, she said. Oh, Teresa. Wow. Hello, Teresa. And of course, we've got our lovely Tamika here as well. Hello. Hi, she's Tamika. one of our seniors. <laughs> very, very special team member. And then we've got, um, yeah, so Teresa, let's put this up. I'm sure you can see that, can't you? I think. Our connection and depending on time technology lead us to forget the knowledge accumulated during years. That's very, very true. And you do talk about that quite often. Don't Teresa, you? can you let Chelsea know if we can put that in inverted commas in your name and quote you? That is yeah, so, so I'm sure you would so like that. I'll, I'll connect with you shortly. Yeah. So maybe we could discuss that. Is just that. It's very, very true and very well articulated as well. Yeah, and so lovely that you're there. Wow. Yes, thank you for watching. She said that I wish I'd mm -hmm. have known you 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I'm um, getting too old to do too much now. <laughs> I think even even during the time you were you were out with, uh, working alongside women, I think there's just not enough of you to go around for the of us that wish. No, we I you. no, and but there were more then. We had a lovely group of midwives in the area that I. But then I worked all over the country, and of course I flew to Japan for my grandson and back to Melbourne. You know, and the. 18 months later, the other little one come along. So I've been very fortunate about being able to move around. And I think somewhere along the line, I got called the travelling midwife. So oh, wow. I, I went up to the Northern Territory for a woman who was having trouble because of all of the uh, politics that was going on up there. Um, her midwives were feeling quite uh, disabled by it all. 
So I went up for her and included my colleagues up there, you know, and I ended up going back for more. And so I got a beautiful, beautiful group of co midwife colleagues up there. And, and, and so, I, and I will never forget them till the day I die. Just amazing, you know, so it's um, Meryl and, and Mo and look, I, it, all, all those beautiful people were just like, you know, they were part of our, it was like a family, really. Mm, mm. Mm. I think we definitely and, need to rebuild and repair those transition yeah. relationships. Yeah, and then I flew to New South Wales on a plane very quickly with, and my one of my New South Wales colleagues dropped her gear off at the home for me <laughs> <laughs> because I was at another birth and didn't think I was going to make it. But guess what? She waited for me. <laughs> oh, wow. Look at that. <laughs> yeah. I've had a few women who I've been on a journey and are coming back from wherever. Mm -hmm. We've actually waited, including my sister-in-law, who I was in the Northern Territory at a conference speaking. As soon as I finished, I got on a plane once I heard the message and I got back in time for her. Wow. I mean, it would be so, such a privilege. Those that yeah. have um, have been privileged enough to to birth yeah. with you in their corner I'm sure they they would agree it's very special so I talk about one day at a time one moment at a time and then you know we can think about this particular woman what her history is how she feels and how we will be able to help her in 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 the range of ways that we can yeah absolutely and mm -hmm. and if those watching have been have enjoyed today's session and would like to learn more about Dr. Robin's amazing work and the Thompson Method as a whole, I've shared the link below for a blog article that you can head over to read. Um, if you're preparing to breastfeed or to birth, then do go check it out and um, yeah, really do familiarise yourself with, with Dr. Robin and her wonderful work. There is uh, evidence-based research behind this and we are very privileged to be a part of it so um nicolina's just popped in nicolina i'm sorry i haven't got time to reach out but hello and thank you for watching um she learned from dr robin oh let's read it out we've got time for this this looks like a lovely one i would love to know more about home birthing i have applied one lesson i learned from dr robin thompson just last year in her hospital birth ah there you go she's eager to learn more well nicolina i will be speaking to you very shortly yeah. and to those who have also taken part in today's show and joined in and watched. Thank you so much for watching. But most importantly, of course, thank you so much to Dr. Robin Thompson for your ongoing support and work for women. Thank you, lovely Chelsea. It's always a pleasure. Oh, it definitely <laughs> is. Thank you so much, everyone. We will see you next Wednesday. Take care.